All right. Well, welcome to chapel. Welcome to the conference on global engagement. First time by that name. We used to call it Missions Emphasis Week. Uh, for those of you who are who are new students here or haven't been here before and may not be familiar with the whole offering thing, uh, we take an offering during this this week during these chapels, and those funds are then set aside for students who are going to be going on summer missions trips. And so, if you are a student, and you're sitting here and you're thinking about what you're doing for the summer, could possibly going on a summer missions trip. Then later on in this semester, I'll have applications available for that but so you guys know why we're doing that and so how about the uh, how about the song this morning hey okay, that's that is what heaven is gonna sound like people revelation and I saw a multitude from every tribe and tongue and language I'm paraphrasing gathering around the throne singing praise to the one who sits on the throne in the lamb so uh, one quick announcement before I, before I welcome our speaker up, but hopefully you all have received schedules and emails and brochures and everything, but just to make sure everybody is aware that we will be back in here at 8 a.m. tomorrow. I know, I need shield, don't kill me. Uh, it's early, but um, I think it'll be worth it. We have, great, uh, we have a great schedule planned out with speakers and everything. Make sure that you stop into the Lane Maid Room and pay a visit to all these folks who are here visiting with us today. So uh, with no further ado, we have someone that you all know and you hopefully all love because he's an awesome guy, but Dan Anderson. Great privilege to be able to be back at Calvary Bible College. I began studying here in 1988. That was like the last millennium or something, wasn't it? Or the last century? I don't know. No. Wow, long time ago. And uh, we're obviously not in the chapel over here, but we had missions uh, emphasis in very much the same way. And I just, I just want to share for just a minute the impact that Calvary had on my life. I honestly had dedicated my life to serving God however he would desire. I feel like I'm just a little bit hot, if you can come down a little, sorry. And uh, came to Calvary thinking, okay, I need to learn about culture, I need to learn about other nations, I need to learn all these things, but honestly, the thing that I learned most at Calvary, the greatest impact in my life, was how to study and understand the Word of God. And then that ends up laying the groundwork for everything that missions is all about. What a beautiful thing this morning with the song that you shared. Uh, in this picture here, three of my children were born in Brazil, and so they have dual nationality. Uh, my children were in Brazil 13 of their formative years, um, so Elizabeth was like five when we got there. And honestly, the song that you sang this morning, probably every one of my kids would have been in tears because of the memory of, uh, of being back in Brazil and the memory of singing praises to God in another language. If you have never gone on a foreign missions trip, little advertisement, you have got to do it no matter what your major. It will change your life. It will impact your life to be sitting with people in another culture that are praising the same exact God that we believe in, that are worshiping the same God that Scripture teaches about. And uh, you may not recognize the tune, you may, but to realize that they're serving that God is an awesome, awesome privilege. And to this day, there are songs that we sing in church, even now that we're back in the U.S., that as we start singing it, I'll look down the row and I will see all of my kids singing it in Portuguese and remembering the great work that God did, not only in the souls of others, but also in our own lives through that. So please take those opportunities. I grew up in Pueblo, Colorado, and we actually got to know each other in Colorado Springs. But Pueblo, Colorado, if you've never been there, is a great town. It's a great town for sending for, like, the government books. Don't they have something like that? You write to Pueblo, Colorado for, I don't know how to use my smartphone type things and so on. But Pueblo, Colorado, when I grew up there, was uh, predominantly, really, Latin American. Most of my friends, uh, most of my teachers in the school were Hispanic. Uh, grew up hearing a lot of Spanish, and later as I got to know some people that spoke Spanish better than the people I knew there, I'd say, what does this word mean? And they'd tell me, and I'd get mad about what my friends had been calling me all those years, and I hadn't, <laughs> you know. And if you speak Spanish, you can come up and you can help me probably understand a few more of those. But one of the things that I never really grasped when I was in Pueblo, Colorado, was the strength 
of religion in many nations around the world. We had large cathedrals in our town. You would go into homes and you would have people that would have maybe a, a, a little area where they'd have a place that they would be burning candles and incense. You would see many times um, small idols that they would have, small images that they would have in their car or things that they'd have hanging from their rearview mirror. But it never really, I don't know that it never really sunk in of what, what is this all about? Why are they thinking this? Why do they do this? Until I got to Brazil and began to understand a little bit more about the Roman Catholic culture in Brazil. It's interesting, as you survey the United States, the majority of people would say that they are Christians. I was in a, a situation recently where I, I went back to apologize to a car salesman that I had offended, and he said, oh, are you a Christian too? And the truth is, we were approaching Christianity and what it means in a very different way. In Brazil, it's not uncommon to see images very much like this, where people are holding on to religion, holding on to tradi to tradition, very, very committed, people that are giving their lives for this religion that they, they believe is going to save them, but they truly have no understanding of what Scripture teaches about salvation by faith in Christ alone. And that brings us to the question, really, that we, we even sang about this morning, the verses, Josh, that you read from Revelation refer to, and that is the fact that Jesus Christ shed his blood so that we could have eternal life. The cross is an image that many people turn to and they look to and they pray to and they think is so important. But the truth is, we have to decide as people what we believe about the cross. Just because you're students here at Calvary Bible College, I know from my 30 years ago here, just because you're a student at Calvary Bible College doesn't mean that you have a biblical understanding of what the cross is and what it signifies and what the importance is of it in your life. Well, we're going to be taking a look at kind of an overview of the book of Luke this morning. Luke in, is really, to me, one of my favorite Gospels. It's, it is the Gospel that, that I preach through in church plants because my plan was always to go on to the book of Acts and the start of the church. Luke is a, is a Gospel that is just filled with references to Jesus Christ. Luke, more than any other Gospel, it would be very popular with the Me Too generation right now because Luke, more than any other Gospel, brings uh, reference to the women that were in Jesus' ministry, the women that Jesus ministered to, those that came to faith and so on. But Luke, more than anything else, focuses on the identity of Jesus Christ. The identity of Jesus Christ is central in this, and we need to have an understanding of what is going on in this, this uh, presentation of Jesus Christ in Luke to really understand what we're going to study today in Luke chapter 9. The book of Luke starts out with an angel appearing to Zechariah, and the angel tells him that he is going to have a son and that the son is going to be a messenger that comes before the Lord, preparing the way for the Lord. Angel later appears to Mary, and in speaking to Mary and telling Mary that even though she was unmarried, even though that she was still a virgin, that the Holy Spirit was going to come upon her and that she is going to give birth to a child, and that child would be the Son of God. That child would bring salvation. That child would reign eternally on the throne of his father David and that he would reign forevermore. References back to the Davidic covenant. References back to the Old Testament as it talked about a, a, an heir of Abraham and David finally coming to be on the throne. Mary, when she went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, Zachariah's wife, you remember that John the Baptist leaped inside of her womb and she said to Mary, why am I so blessed that the mother of my Lord would come to visit me? The Holy Spirit speaking through her, letting her know the child that she was going to bear was important, was different. The Lord Mary then talking about the child calls God her Savior in the following verses. Zechariah later in Luke chapter 1 says, We are blessed. Blessed be the Lord God because he has visited and redeemed and saved his people. We spoke about that last time I was here in chapel. He goes on further then to talk about the work of John the Baptist in Luke 1 about verse 76. And he says, John, you will go before the Lord preparing his way. Angels then appear to shepherds, the poor, the, the outcast of society in many ways. The angel appears to them and says, don't be afraid, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, what? 
a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Christ there, the reference to the Messiah. Further in Luke chapter 2, they come into the temple where they're going to dedicate the baby. And a man in the temple comes up to them, and this man had had the Holy Spirit reveal to him that he would not pass away until he had seen the Lord's Christ. He comes up to them, and as he sees his child, and by the Holy Spirit recognizes that this is the Messiah, he again speaks of the fact that this is the Messiah, speaks of the fact that this is a, a changing, a life-changing, world-changing situation in Luke chapter 2, the birth of the Christ. Let me read exactly what he said here. Simeon says to them at that time this, okay, that he had seen, Lord, you are now letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. He goes on, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory for the people. Then Anna comes up to them and says, this child is going to bring grief to you, mother, but he is going to bring salvation to the people of God. Luke chapter 3, we go into the baptism of Jesus. John the Baptist, who had been prophesied in the Old Testament, along with Jesus as being the, the, the one that would come prepare the way, John the Baptist is baptizing in the wilderness, and he says to people that ask him, are you the Christ? He says, no, there comes one after me who is greater than I. And then one day he lifts his eyes, and Jesus is coming, and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is all about the identity of Jesus Christ. Jesus then comes to John the Baptist, asks to be baptized. John says, no, Lord, I, I can't baptize you. And, and Jesus says, please do this. This is what God's will is. As he is baptized, anybody remember what the voice from heaven said about Jesus Christ? You are my son, and you I am well pleased. God the Father himself speaking to us about the identity of this baby that was born of a virgin that was fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies. If that's not enough for us, then Jesus is driven out into the wilderness and Satan himself, recognizing who this is, says, if you're the Christ, command that these stones be turned into bread. If you are the Christ, do this. If you are the Christ, do this. Later, in Luke chapter 5, Jesus, as he's casting out demons, they said to him, what do you have to do with us? We know, listen to the words of the demons, we know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus said, shut up. And he would not let them give testimony. Jesus is in the boat with his disciples. A huge storm comes up. And as the disciples are fearful for their lives, they wake Jesus. He stands up and says, be still, wind and waves. And immediately is calm. Listen to the words of the disciples. What manner of man is this that he speaks and even the wind and the waves listen to him? By the way, there's reference to that back in the book of Psalms. All of this pointing to the identity of Jesus Christ. And we finally come into Luke chapter 9. Herod, hears about the things going on, is fearful because he wonders if John the Baptist, who he had killed, had come back to life. And Herod asks, is, is this past possibly John? And this all prepares us for Luke chapter 9, verse 18 to 22, where Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, who do men say that I am? The disciples answer, some say the prophet, some say maybe uh, Moses of old. And Jesus then turns to them and says, and who do you say that I am? And Peter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, makes a statement upon which God promises to build his church. Christ promised to build his church. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now, this is all significant. It's all important. And we all, we all sit and we think, what on earth does this have to do with the missions conference? But the importance of this passage is actually the verses following it where Jesus not only affirms that what Peter said was true, but Jesus goes on to expand what Peter was saying and say, you're right, you're correct, I am the Christ. But let me tell you what Christ I am. I'm not the Christ that you were expecting. I'm not the Christ that you were expecting that you thought would just free you from Rome. Let me tell you what the Old Testament says about me and present to you that I am the Christ, yes, but I'm the suffering Christ. The cross is central to the identity of Jesus Christ. 
And we have to understand that, one, if we're going to come to, to faith in Christ and salvation, but two, if we're going to understand the motivation for missions and why it's important and why it's critical in our lives. The cross of the Christ in Luke chapter have your Bibles, turn with me there to Luke 9, 22. The minutes we have will, will be remaining here in this passage. Jesus turns to the disciples, okay, in verse 21, it says, He strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And then he said to all of them, If anyone would come after me, let him lay down his cross and deny himself and follow me. The cross of the Christ in Luke chapter 9, verse 22, is a very interesting thing because in the very few words that are stated here is a plethora, is a huge amount of information about why the Christ was so important, why the cross was so important. The cross of Jesus Christ was important because it was mandatory. Now, I understood, Josh, when you said that we all have to be back here tomorrow at 8 o'clock. There are things at Calvary that are mandatory. Back in my day, Dr. Williams, there, there were things that were mandatory that I had to do for your class. And some of them I didn't do, and I had problems in my class because of that, right? <laughs> when, when I use the word mandatory here, does it leave any question in your mind what's try, what I'm trying to communicate? Mandatory has the idea that it is not optional. It's not something that you can choose between one thing or the other, and that was true of the cross for Jesus Christ. The cross was mandatory. Again, Luke chapter 9, verse 22, it says this, okay, the Son of Man must suffer many things. Do we have a prof here who teaches like English and that stuff? Yeah. Is she here right now? She's sick today. Oh, he, you teach English. Okay, well, I'm grateful there aren't two of you because I will make a number of English mistakes here. But this word, must, is significant. It's interesting to me that learning a second language, learning a foreign language, helped my understanding and my study of Scripture. Did you find that true? Because you would see translations. You'd see words that you just skimmed over your whole life. And I'm sure that, that those of you that study Greek probably have the same thing. Words that you just had, had jumped right over, and you go, wow, deve. Devi is the word in Portuguese. Have to do something. You go, what does this mean? You come back to English, you realize it's been there the whole time. The Son of Man must suffer many things. The cross for Jesus Christ was a mandatory thing because it was God the Father's plan for him. Here are the things that are described here that were mandatory. The Son of Man must, first of all, suffer. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5 uh, verses that you probably know, verses that you've read, verses that the, the majority of Jews do just turn right over when they go through their, their uh, prophet of Isaiah. It says that he would be stricken, smitten, afflicted, pierced, crushed. By his wounds, we would be healed. This speaking and prophecy of the Messiah was telling us that he would suffer. So when Jesus says here in Luke 9, 22, that the Son of Man must suffer, it shouldn't have been a surprise to Israel, but it definitely was, because that's not what they were looking for. They weren't looking for someone to come and suffer in their place and to die for their sins. They were looking for a leader, a religious leader. The passage goes on to say not only that the Son of Man must suffer, but he must suffer many things. Now, Isaiah 53. Anybody in here studied Isaiah 53 for any class? Anybody, at Dr. Williamson, you were Old Testament guy. Did, have you studied Isaiah 53, ever taught there? Huge, huge um, ties that you can make there to crucifixion. The piercing, the stripes, all these different things that take place there. But can I ask a question? Why would Jesus say, not only must the Son of Man suffer, but he must suffer many things? There is suffering that goes beyond physical pain, isn't there? Have you ever experienced it? You know, the rejection of a family member or loved one? The rejection in a dating relationship where it comes to an end, the pain that comes? I believe that partially what Jesus is referring to here is found in Matthew 27, verse 46, when on the cross, Jesus says, Eloi, Eloi, and I don't remember the rest, what? My God, my God, what? Why have you forsaken me? 
The greatest suffering that Jesus encountered was not the plucking of the beard. It was not the thorns of crown, the crown of thorns upon his head. It wasn't the whipping. It wasn't being nailed to the cross. It wasn't having his side pierced. The greatest suffering that Jesus encountered was when God the Father had to turn his back on God the Son because of my sins and your sins. The cross was important. Jesus had to suffer, and he had to suffer many things. The passage goes on to say that he must be rejected. Isaiah 53 talks about this. We considered him despised, rejected of men, a man of sorrows. It talks about his rejection by man, but then it also says that he must be killed. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah 53. We won't read all of the verses, but Isaiah 53 verse 10 is crucial. It's one that years and years of, of reading the Bible as a young person, even studying and, and memorizing verses out of Isaiah 53, I always stopped like verse 6 or so, probably a wanna club. That's where they had to stop in our memorizing of these. But Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, has a critical thing that it says about Christ there. Isaiah 53, verse 10, talking about his crucifixion, says this. Isaiah 53, verse 10 says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. How do you understand that? God the Father chose to put... God the Son in this position of suffering on the cross to put him in a position where the sins of the world were placed upon his body, where he would die and pay the price for those so that those who believe could have eternal life. He chose that. It was his will. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 says that we were not redeemed from our old manner of life by perishable things like silver and gold. Do you remember the rest of the verse? But with... The blood of Jesus, the precious blood of Jesus, a lamb without spot. And then listen to verse 20. Whom God foreknew for the purpose of going to the cross for us. Paraphrase of mine. The cross was mandatory. It was exactly what God the Father had planned for his son. And that is just an amazing thing. Praise the Lord, the passage goes on to say that he would be raised on the third day. And we don't have time to look at these verses but we need to understand something that is crucial at this moment. Just because the cross of Jesus Christ was mandatory, it does not lessen the fact that it was voluntary. Jesus chose to go to the cross for you and for me. Jesus voluntarily went to the cross. He was not taken there by the soldiers that were holding on to him. I've heard poetry in the past say something like this, that the nails didn't hold him to the cross. It was his love for you and for I. And, and there's some truth to this because Jesus could have called, as the song said, 10,000 angels. He could have been taken down from the cross, but he stayed there because of his love for you and for me. Luke chapter 9, verse 51, the same passage that we're studying a little later in the passage, it talks about a change in Jesus' ministry where Jesus turns in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it says this, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, and I believe that that's referring to being lifted up in crucifixion and also his returning to heaven. When the days came near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Listen to what this is saying. Jesus, who had been ministering all around Israel, when he knew the time was come for his crucifixion, turned toward Jerusalem, and every step he took from this point forward took him a step closer to the cross. Jesus knew what was waiting there for him, and he embraced it. Now, I don't know about you. If I had the ability to see into the future, I would avoid anything that's going to bring me pain. Wouldn't you? First of all, I, I wouldn't have put any hope in the Broncos this year, okay? Sorry, Kansas City, I wanted you to go. I wish you had because I hate the Patriots, but we won't go there right now, Okay? <laughs> If I could see into the future, I would avoid what would cause me pain, either physically or monetarily or whatever. Jesus, knowing that crucifixion was in Jerusalem, set his face toward Jerusalem. Jesus chose to go there because of his love for you and me. Luke chapter 22, verse 42, Jesus is in the garden, and he's saying to the Father as he is in anguish in the garden, praying to the Father, he says, Father, if there is any other way, take this cup from me. But do you remember the end 
of that conversation with God? Nevertheless, what, Jordan? Nevertheless, your will be done, not my will. Jesus voluntarily went to the cross. We also have Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8, the great example for us of selflessness, where it's held up to us what Jesus did. Remember this? This is, uh, Prof, help me out. Is this a kenosis passage? Is that right? Where it talks about God remaining God and yet taking on flesh and being completely man and completely God, an amazing passage. But listen what it says. Jesus was humbled by God to put on human flesh. And he was humbled further by God to be put on the cross and to die for our sins. Is that what it says? It actually says that Jesus humbled himself. John chapter 15, John chapter 10, verses 15 and 18, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd has his life taken from him for the sheep. Is that what your translation says? Actually, it says, the good shepherd lays down his life. He makes the choice to lay down his life. In Italian and Portuguese and Spanish, we would say, si coloco a sua vida. He made the choice to put his life on the line for us. The cross of Jesus Christ was voluntary. Jesus is the suffering Messiah. He's the one that the scriptures talk about. He is the one that Israel, the leaders, rejected. He is the one that went to the cross to die for our sins. He is the one that rose again. And we come to the point as students that are here at Calvary, as missionaries that are here, as people that have heard the gospel over and over again, where we have to ask the question, what have I chosen to do with Christ? What have I chosen to do with the Christ that went to the cross? Now, all of this to come down to this point. What does this have to do with missions? Everything in the sense of this is the message that we're taking to the world, but the passage goes further than that. Turn back with me to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, where we had just been reading, he said that the Son of Man must suffer all these things and so on. He told them that they shouldn't tell anybody. And then Jesus says to them, listen, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Here's the whole point. Jesus' death on the cross was not purposed to be an example for us. Jesus' death on the cross was for our salvation. That was, that was the purpose. But Jesus' death on the cross also serves as an example for us. In the way that Jesus embraced God's will for his life, he challenges us to do the same thing. I'm going to have to run forward real quick to catch up with this. And it looks like I'm pushing it too fast. I'm sorry. What does this have to do with us, the cross of the Christian? The cross of the Christian that is mentioned in verses 23 to 26 is this. He says, first of all, deny yourself. I think right away of Ephesians chapter 4, 22 and 23, which says, put off the old man. Be renewed in what is taking place and put on the new man. I've been saved for 44 years. I'm guessing that you've been saved, Warren, more years than that. Long time? How long? 55, 55 years. Do you still find that it's work to put off the old man and to put on the new? It's daily. It's constant. Constantly I am having to say, no, I'm not going to embrace what my sinful flesh desires. Yes, I'm going to say yes to what God wants. And I still fail. Warren still fail after 55 years? I have to come back and seek his forgiveness. The cross of the Christian, we're told to deny ourselves. We're also told to take up our cross daily. We could debate for quite some time this morning whether this is talking about a literal cross or whether it's an example. For example, I, when I was in college, I had some roommates that I would say, oh, I have a heavy cross to bear. Have you guys said something like that before? I have a lot to put up with with this person. My wife probably says this sometimes in her journaling. You know, it's a heavy cross being married to Dan. But the fact is, I think that this passage points to the fact that as I follow Christ, there will be suffering. 
there will be difficulties. Hebrews chapter 12, we have this great cloud of witness around us, and we're told to follow Christ and to follow his example as he puts his focus on the finish line. And the truth is, each one of us has to say, okay, God, what is it you have for my life? We're told to follow Christ. 1 Peter 2 says we follow him and his example of suffering. 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says to the church in Corinth, follow me as I follow Christ. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, again, the idea to train faithful men, we follow. But here's the whole point of all of this. The whole point of all of this is that the cross of the Christian, in the same way that Jesus' cross was mandatory, is also mandatory for us. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, and I'm going to have to close here. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says this, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, wholly acceptable unto God. Paul pleads with us as Christians to give our lives back to God and say, God, here is my life. Not only, God, I want to live a holy life for you, but it's saying, God, here's my life. Do with my life whatever you please. The end of the verse comes down to something that I never understood until I learned Portuguese. It says that we should present our bodies as living sacrifices, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable act of worship. The King James says, your, your, uh, is it reasonable act of worship in King James? ESV and NIV, NASB don't do as well, actually, as the King James in this. In Portuguese, it was your culto racional. A kultu was, is an act of worship, the way that you worship, your, your process of worshiping God. The rational means this. For me to do anything but give my life to my Savior. For me to do anything but say, God, my life is not my own, it's yours. Do with it as you please. Is idiotic. That's what the rational means. It's rational that I would give my life to God in that way. Why? Because of everything that he did on the cross for me. Because my only, my only being is because of him. And so as we come into this week of missions conference, what a tremendous week, what a great blessing this week is going to be if we as believers are ready to say, God, my life is not my own. That's why scripture is so important for missions. Because there are a lot of things about missions that are not enjoyable. Ask some of these people around you. But the these missionaries came to a point of saying, God, my life is yours. Do with me as you please. It is a mandatory thing, but it's also voluntary. We have the choice to say, God, here's my life. I give it to you. I pray that that'll be what you do this week. We'd love to talk to you, any one of us missionaries. Joshua, thank you so much for the opportunity for us to be here this week and the school staff. I know that you take time out from your classes for the missionaries to be here. And we are so excited to see what God is going to do in each of our lives this week as we hear about missions around the world. So Josh, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, 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 hey. hey stay. Stay. Are we sitting down? Well, I, if you want to sit down. Is there coffee? Do you prefer to stand? Uh, the coffee is downstairs, but okay. I hear you've already been there. I have. <laughs> All right, we've got, yeah, we've got a couple of minutes, a couple of questions. Anybody want to send something on on Twitter or just shout it out from the audience? I should have reminded you all before you started speaking. But uh, so anybody, anything? You may want to pick Dan's brain. I don't have anything. You did pretty good. So, yeah. I have a question. When did you said that there's a point to where you, for like missionaries, is a point to where you have to like surrender that? When was that point for you? When did you know that you were going to be? Okay, when I was in high school, um, I trusted Christ as like five years old, but I had some years that I wasn't walking in obedience to the Lord. And it was actually at a camp that I came to surrender of just saying, God, my life is yours. Do anything that you want. And it was a year later that I was convinced that God wanted me to be a missionary. And it was through rubbing shoulders with other missionaries and hearing about that, reading missionary biographies. And it actually was just a time of saying, I'm willing to do that. God, I, I want other people to know about you. And so that's, that's what the life change was for me. And also then seeing some of my friends during that time. You'll remember Dave Lauer and some others from, from our time in youth group. 
some friends that came to the Lord, and I thought, wow, I want to spend my life doing this. And so that's when the, the dedication of that happened for me. Could you perhaps share um, a testimony of maybe some of the really bitter suffering that you have went through that might have perhaps caused you to, um, at times, say, I can't do this, and share that with us as a testimony to the Lord? Um, because it sounds... We have people up here, it always sounds fine and dandy, but like you said, there is suffering. So what is some real practical suffering in your life that has caused you to want to quit? Okay, there, there won't be time to go into much detail there. Some of the first suffering were the first classes I had with Mr. Williamson. Okay? <laughs> you know, I was like, you, you said the question. You, are, you said, when did you, when did you come to... <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, when did you come to a point of saying, I can't do this? Some of you are at that point right now in your studies because it's hard and there were things we had to do. But then in Brazil, our home was, was robbed probably like two dozen times. Um, we'd come home from church and, and the kids would say, do you think they stole my bike this time, Dad? And you didn't want that as a father for kids. And then if you, if you have time later, sit down with me. There were some shootings in Brazil. A coworker was shot. And a lot of questions for me of, okay, this isn't what I signed up for. You know, a feeling of, no, God, I, I didn't say I'd do this. And then I looked back to journaling that I did in the dormitory here where nightly I would be praying, by life or by death, God, be glorified. And I'd go back and i go, I didn't mean that. <laughs> Not in that way. Or as I started having children, realizing that it could affect their lives too. And those were the times where I had to just come back and say, okay, do I, do I believe he's sovereign? Do I believe he's in control or not? And so it, I, I'd love to share those things. Again, not time at this moment to share it, but there were some difficult times where I just said, no, this is more than what I, I thought I signed up for. And I had to come back to, okay, God, I told you anything you ask of me. Um, this may be along the same line, so it might be, even be a similar answer. But what was your least favorite thing you did as a missionary? How did you submit to God in that instance? Um, the least favorite thing, I think, is, is culture-wise, and, and I know you could confirm this, culture-wise, you go through kind of a honeymoon stage where you're, it's kind of cool that you're at a different place and you're learning it, and language is, is hard, and you're learning it, and you get past that. But honestly, there, there came a point in my time in Brazil that I began to really hate what I saw in the Brazilian culture. Um, I get on planes, and I see 65-year-old men with 20-year-old wives, and I know that they have traded their wives in four or five times. And I hate it. I'm disgusted by it, you know. And um, you have to get beyond that hatred to realize, okay, this is just a symptom. This is just a symptom of their need for Christ. And so I'd say that was honestly the hardest thing for me. Uh, one more. Because we have, you know, we have some students here who uh, aren't feeling called into the mission field. And so what advice do you have? for those not going into the mission field to help those who are? Uh, I'd say that the advice there would be, would be very direct to you, and that is this. Um, the mission field is on our doorsteps. Amen. Um, I came back from Brazil where I was there clearly for a purpose. I remember going to Russia in 93, and someone asked me, a, a soldier asked me, why are you here? And I could clearly say, I'm here for this reason. When I come back to the United States, I forget that. I forget that the reason I'm here, not in the United States, but here in this world, is for the purpose of leading people to faith in Jesus Christ. And so um, my encouragement would be to you to use any ability that God has given you, whether it's musical, business, whatever, to reach those around you. Just last two days ago, my daughter had a piano recital, and there was an Asian girl a, a, from China who was obviously much better than my daughter. Okay, Any of you have been in music competitions? There are some Asians that play incredibly a piano. They're, you know, and and your, your daughter goes, I've been working so hard, I can never be this good. And you're like, no, just keep working. They're very dedicated. But as I talked to the parents, Gary and his wife, Ping, from China, I realized that they have lived here in the United States for 20 years and they have very few relationships because we are very close people for people around us. And we need to begin seeing missions as right here, right now, and so it's, it's not just somebody's called to go to Brazil or Italy or wherever. It is God has every one of us here 
to be missionaries and to reach people for Christ wherever he's placed us. We're called to make disciples regardless of the location. Amen. 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 All right. Thanks, Dan. Would you pray for us? Amen. And then we'll get out of here. Heavenly Father, what a privilege, Lord, to open your word today and be reminded of the first missionary, Jesus Christ, who left heaven, Lord, to come to this earth so that we could have eternal life. Lord, what a great reminder our singing was this morning of that day in heaven that Revelation 5 and 7 talks about where people from every tribe, language, nation, tongue will be gathered around the throne. Not all singing in English, not all singing in Portuguese or Hebrew, but I think, Lord, singing in their own tongues worship to you because of the salvation that you brought. Thank you that you love the nations. Help us to love them as well and to preach Christ wherever we have opportunity. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Amen.